and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Over the course of my time as rector of St. John's, more than a decade now, people have come and people have gone. Every person who comes is a delight to get to know, truly almost without exception, you know who you are. And every person who leaves is a painful experience, definitely without exception, I can honestly say. I can say without a doubt that any person who's left our church since I've been here has resulted in a painful experience of a portion of the body of Christ being rent asunder. Now people leave churches for all kinds of reasons, many of them good and related to their own desire to grow in Christ, something for some reason they find themselves unable to do in their current congregational context, and so they need to find a place where they can grow and thrive. But every now and then, someone leaves a church for reasons that are a bit different than that. I'll give you two examples. At one point, someone left our congregation saying that the reason they left is because, quote, Jared, that you see, your sermons are just so biblical. Well, thank you. That may be my favorite criticism I have ever received. It actually felt like kind of a compliment. Another person once left saying, well, Jared talks entirely too much about God and spirituality, and to me, the church is much more like a social club. Well, okay then. Not much I could do to make that better, right? In the end, no church can be for all people. And it's okay. That's okay. That shouldn't freak us out like it freaks us out so often. Every person does need to find a place where they can grow in love of God and neighbor. And sometimes that's not the congregation you happen to be a part of at that moment. But we should also be clear that not every person is interested in growing in love of God and neighbor. That's not why every person goes to church. One of the oddest things someone said to me once is that they were leaving the church because they didn't always leave church on Sunday feeling happy about themselves. And I said, I think that's okay sometimes. Sometimes I think we need to be convicted by the Holy Spirit that we should live our lives a little differently than we used to. We should leave church feeling that conviction in our heart. If all you're interested in is motivational speaking and inspiring music that makes you feel better about yourself, then I highly commend watching Joel Osteen on TV instead of being a part of the Christian community. The production quality is much better than what we can pull off on YouTube after all, right? When Paul writes his letter to the church at Rome, he's writing to a church that's been torn asunder by the old guard versus the newcomers. On one side of the Jewish Christians who had to leave their congregation because of persecution, but while they were gone, the Roman Christians had been converting into the church and started filling the congregation up. And once the persecution ended and the Jewish Christians came back, they found a church that was different than the church they used to go to. They were frustrated by that experience, something we can all understand, maybe even relate to. And so Paul is trying so very hard to be clear in his letter to the Romans that you being a part of the church is not about you feeling better. Paul has no interest in you living your best life now. Rather, Paul is trying to invite people into a deeper experience of discipleship, one in which they are truly willing to die to themselves, just as Christ died on the cross, so that they might experience the resurrecting power of the Spirit. Because you will never experience your best life now your truly best life now until you're willing to die to all the things that you want to hold on to too tightly in this life. That is just simply the painful gospel truth. And what Paul is saying here in Romans 12 is based on everything that's come before, all of the previous 11 chapters of theological arguments that have preceded this text. As the old preacher line says, whenever you see a therefore in the text, you should always stop and ask what it's there for. (laughs) And if you do that and go back, you'll see Paul has spent the past 11 chapters making it clear that each and every one of us, whether Jew or Gentile, whether new to the church or baptized as a baby, each and every one of us is part of this community because of God's gracious love and mercy. Not because we're the ones who get it right when everyone else, of course, gets it wrong. In the most immediate chapters, Paul has been clear that God is always faithful to his promise to the Israelites, has always been faithful, and that the unfaithful of Israel is just like the unfaithfulness of Gentiles. Both exist without doubt, but God chooses to be merciful to all people, especially in including the unfaithful. 
All God asks in return is that you choose to be part of him and his work in this world by turning from your unfaithfulness once again, every day, to live a life of constant repentance, constant turning towards Christ and the cross. Therefore, in chapter 12, Paul demonstrates the difference between what Dietrich Bonhoeffer once called cheap grace and costly grace. Of course, God always shows mercy. Paul has been clear. But in chapter 12, Paul continues the argument by saying, but God shows mercy, not so that we might feel better about ourselves, but so that you and I might be changed, so that we might be transformed, no longer conformed to this world, but transformed people. As Bonhoeffer wrote, and this is a long quote, so hold on. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without require, requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is a treasure hidden in the field for the sake of it a man will go and sell everything that he has it is the pearl of great price that you buy when the merchant when the merchant will sell all of his goods to buy it is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man would pluck out an eye if it causes him to stumble it is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again the gift which must be asked for the door at which a man must not must not such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And yet it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. Or, as Paul puts it, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Bonhoeffer put it another way in the same book when he said that when Christ calls a person, it is, he bids that person to come and die. Or once more, using Paul's words, I appeal to you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And you know the odd thing about a sacrifice, you've got to be willing to kill something to be able to sacrifice it. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, dying to all that is sinful in you so that you might truly live as life was intended by God. Yes, this is not a gospel meant to make you feel better. Instead, it's a gospel meant to make you better, to make you a better person, one who is a better reflection of God's love and mercy to this broken and unjust world. And don't get me wrong, if you're reading this text and thinking, well, I know all kinds of Christians who don't fit this bill, you're probably not hearing me right. Because all of us need to do this better. And the truth is, what that transformation looks like is going to be different for each and every one of us. Each and every one of us must live out the call of Christ the way God has called us to do it in our own lives. All of us are called to die in different ways to different things so that God's goodness may be manifest in our own particular lives. And even people who do this massively different than you, they're still part of the body of Christ, Paul says. We are members one of another. He reminds us we've all got different gifts according to the grace we've been given by God. And that's okay. Some people are amazing at prophecy, articulating the truth of God in ways that are uncomfortable and disturbing, and the church needs those people. Some people are wonderful at ministry, caring for and serving those who are in pain, binding up their wounds. The church needs those people. Other people can teach the truths of the Bible, while others can exhort and encourage us when we want to give up. Some people are just really good at being generous, generous with everything God has given them. Some people are called to be leaders who persevere with diligence even when the context is tricky. And some people are called just to be compassionate in a world that's so short of compassion in Paul's time and our own. All of us are going to do it differently. The great thing about being transformed is you're not transformed into some cookie cutter of what Jared thinks a Christian is or what someone's told you a Christian is. You're transformed into the unique and beautiful person God has called you to be with the gifts that you have put to work to do God's work in this world. So it's not that you need to be the sort of Christian that I am or that other people are telling you to be. It's not that at all. 
The question is, what is your spiritual act of worship? Your particular spiritual act of worship. What does it mean for you to offer up your own body to the work of God in this world? What would that look like for you? What does it look like for you to stop being conformed to all the brokenness of this world and then instead to let the Holy Spirit transform you into an avenue of God's grace? Because if people look at your life and the way you talk, the way you act, the way you live, and it looks an awful lot like the rest of the world, then maybe you haven't yet sacrificed what God has called you to sacrifice. Maybe you haven't yet been transformed the way God wants to transform you. Because when you lay your body and self upon the altar and God pours mercy upon it, the power of the Spirit, something different will go forth. It'll be different than what I do, absolutely. Thank goodness. It'll probably be different than what lots of other people do. But if it is truly an act of sacrifice, if you are truly willing to give yourself to this Christian life, to pour yourself upon the altar, then you can be a very member of the body of Christ incarnate in this world to heal the broken parts of this world in your own way, just as God had always intended you to be. Go ahead. Try being a transformed avenue of grace. I promise you, it is so much better than being a conformed and happy person. Amen.